Hello, everybody. This is ZK Snacks Episode 3, and today we are going to be breaking down the smart contracts that make the Lightning Network possible. And so I guess to dive right into it, uh, Janine is going to break down the basics of Bitcoin transaction structure and give us a little bit of the nature of the encumbrance scripts that can be used to lock Bitcoin. So take it away, Janine. Yeah, so Bitcoin transactions form an output and input chain, and a transaction output consists of a unit value, which, as we know, is commonly uh, denominated in Satoshis or as decimal fractions of a whole Bitcoin that is spendable or redeemed under certain conditions determined by what is called an encumbrance script. Uh, fun fact, the balance of Bitcoin that you see in your wallet is actually an artificial sum value that your wallet pulls from an aggregate history of all unspent outputs transact, uh, tracked by the Bitcoin network. And so in order to spend an output, you must not only present a valid digital signature or signatures if you're using a multi-sig, but that signature must be um, corresponding to, uh, must be generated by a private key that corresponds to um, the public address where the unspent transaction output or UTXO is locked. Uh, and an output can be locked to one key or multiple keys, which as I said, uh, multiple keys, that's known as a multi-signature transaction, which um, I would consider to be one of the most primitive forms of smart contracts. And so an output can be locked to a hash lock, which is a type of encumbrance that says you can't spend this until a pre-specified piece of data is made publicly um, available. It is possible to create multiple outputs under the same hash lock or even outputs with different encumbrances used to spend a single output. Uh, an output can be locked with a time lock as well. So there's hash lock and time lock. And a time lock is a type of encumbrance that says you can't spend until a particular time or block height in the future. Um, so time lock can also be applied to a pre-signed transaction without being added to an output encumbrance. And so all of these relatively simple components are what form the basis of payment channels and what allow the Lightning Network to function. So Shinobi, you have unidirectional payment channels. A unidirectional payment channel, or a Spillman channel, utilizes a multi-signature address and an unlock time pre-signed transaction. The first thing that must be done to open a payment channel is for both parties to create a multi-signature address together. The party making payments then crafts a funding transaction to the multi-sig address created and does not sign it yet. They then craft another transaction spending the entire output from the funding transaction back to themselves and time lock the transaction with unlock time for however long they want to keep the channel open. After the receiving side of the payment channel signs the refund transaction and returns a copy, the funding transaction can then be signed, submitted to the network and confirmed, thus opening the payment channel. To make payments, the sending side of the channel simply creates another transaction with an output to the receiver in the amount of the payment, signs it, and sends it to the other party. They can make successive payments simply by creating a new transaction with a larger output in the amount of the payment to the other side, and a smaller amount refunded to themselves. Because the sending party never has a copy of old channel states with both required signatures, they are unable to submit old channel states to the network and defraud the other party, but the receiving party is capable of refunding old payments by submitting an old state themselves to the network. To close the channel, the receiving party must simply sign and submit the latest channel state to the network to finalize their balance on-chain and refund any unspent funds to the other party. This channel design has two major drawbacks. One, the receiving party must close the channel before the unlock time on the refund transaction expires, or the spending party may take back all spent funds. Two, this channel design was created before SegWit fixed transaction ID malleability and is vulnerable to malleation attacks where a malleated funding transaction is confirmed invalidating the input of the refund transaction and leaving all funds held hostage by the receiving party. Now that SegWit is active, this type of channel could be safely used utilizing SegWit. And now I will pass it off to Janine, who will go into the next iteration of payment channels. 
A bidirectional or two-way payment channel utilizes a multi-signature scheme and check sequence verify or CSV, which is a relative time lock opcode in Bitcoin. In Lightning, it doesn't start ticking until the time locked output confirms. Unlike uni unidirectional channels that Shinobi just described, bidirectional channels can be left open indefinitely. In order to open and fund the channel, both sides or parties of the channel generate a multi-signature address, which is then funded by inputs from one or both parties or an outside party. However, the transaction remains unsigned until two symmetrical commitment transactions are created to refund each party in the event of a dispute, also known as a non-cooperative closure. Each commitment transaction consists of one output to each of the parties, for example, yourself and your friend. The output to yourself has a revocation key path and the one and one that is time locked. But if you want the ability to immediately spend without a time lock, you just need cooperation from the other party. Once these commitment uh, transactions are created, each party signs the funding transaction and it gets broadcast to the network, thus opening the bidirectional channel. In order to spend money in the channel, each party has to do two things. First, they have to create a new commitment transaction with the updated balance, and then they have to re reveal the revocation key for the prior channel state to each other. There are several different scenarios for channel closure. Honest cooperative, honest non-cooperative, malicious non-cooperative that is penalized, and malicious non-cooperative that is not penalized. In an honest cooperative closure, both parties simply sign a transaction refunding their respective amounts and their channel closes. In an honest non-cooperative closure, the refund commitment for the other party in your channel is confirmed first and then their funds leave the channel. Then your refund commitment is confirmed and your funds leave the channel. So the other party's commitment or refund commitment is always confirmed first. In a malicious non-cooperative closure, i.e. an attempt to cheat, um, such as by broadcasting a prior outdated channel state, you can be penalized by having all of the value in the prior state of the channel, including your Bitcoin, claimed by the honest counterparty using the revocation key. However, if the channel is not being monitored, if, you are, uh, if the other party is not monitoring the channel, then cheating may not be successfully penalized and it could result in theft of the value in the prior state of the channel. However, it is possible to outsource channel closure detection so that if you or the other party are not able to be online to monitor the channel, someone else can do that for you and make sure that um, any attempts at cheating are penalized. So bidirectional channels require a solution to, as, as in the case of unidirectional channels, they also need a solution to transaction malleability to prevent malleated or deformed because the word malleability comes from metallurgy, which means it can be reshaped or deformed. Um, so malleated or deformed commitment transactions from a power state um, should not be able to be confirmed without notice. And if you want to hear more about SegWit, which was first and foremost a transaction malleability solution, we discussed that more in the last CK Snacks video on ASIC Boost. Spillman channels and bidirectional channels were each entirely different designs but the smart contract used to facilitate routed payments is more of an upgrade to bidirectional channels. Hash time lock contracts, or HTLCs, use multisig, CLTB absolute time lock, CSV relative time lock, and hash locks to allow two people without a direct channel to each other to transact. An HTLC transaction is structured a lot like a bidirectional channels commitment transaction. The owner's funds are delayed by a CSV time lock, and the other party's funds are released immediately. We're going to ignore these outputs and paths in this section, though, as they were explained in the last one. The new part is the middle output in each. It has three paths to spend in its script, a revocation key path, a multi-sig with a CLTV lock time, and a multi-sig with a hash lock. The first is obviously to penalize old HTLCs. The second is to allow a refund if a payment fails, and the last is to redeem a successful payment with the hash lock. Both of the last two paths also have pre-signed transactions spending them that have their own CSV lock time on their outputs. We'll see why in a little bit. Creating an HTLC is just like updating the channel state in a bidirectional channel. You create the HTLC transaction and its child transactions and exchange revocation keys for the prior channel state. Before creating an HTLC, however, the person paying must get the payment hash from the person they're paying. 
they then offer an HTLC to the first hop who offers one to the next hop on and on until it gets back to the person being paid. At this point, the person being paid then releases the pre-image of the payment hash to the last hop who then relays it back to the previous hop and so on and so forth until it gets back to the person making the payment. At this point, the payment is guaranteed. To finalize the payment, all channels involved issue a new normal channel state with the appropriate balances and revoke the prior HTLC. This will be done uh, if a payment succeeds or fails. Now an HTLC is structured the way it is so that all funds are guaranteed even if things fall back to the blockchain. This works similar to a normal bidirectional channel state. When the HTLC transaction confirms, the other party's fund are out of the channel minus the payment or refund if it is theirs, while the owner of the HTLC transaction has their output CSV time lock. In the case of a refund, the CLTV time lock must expire, and the party being refunded can confirm the HTLC timeout transaction. This is safe because a failed payment has not released the payment preimage yet, and therefore the success transaction will be invalid. After waiting for the timeout transaction's CSV time lock to expire, they can then confirm the final refund transaction and claim their funds. In the event of a successful payment, the success transaction can be confirmed immediately before the refund path CLTV time lock expires. The redeemer of the payment must then simply wait for the success transaction's CSV time lock to expire and confirm the refund transaction to claim their funds. As an aside, I would like to point out that in the event of a successful payment where the pre-image doesn't fully retrace the payment path back to the original spending node, the HTLC success transaction being spent on-chain would reveal the pre-image to all parties who had not already had it. In the event of a theft attempt, like with a bidirectional channels commitment transaction, the clock starts ticking when the HTLC transaction confirms. You might be able to use a penalty transaction spending directly from the HTLC transaction's payment output, but that is not guaranteed because with an old HTLC from a successful transaction, the CLTV lock time has likely expired and the payment pre-image has been revealed. So each have a equal likelihood of being confirmed first. Even in the case of an unsuccessful payment where the pre-image was not revealed, the person who submitted the HTLC transaction likely isn't entitled to the refund. Either way, um, this is why the success and timeout transactions each have a CSV lock time and revocation key path. If a timeout transaction from an old HTLC state is confirmed, it will be penalized. If a success transaction from an old HTLC state is confirmed, it will be penalized. With old channel states, the protocol enforces a scorched earth policy. And just like with regular bidirectional channels, the only way theft will be successful is if you or no third party like a watchtower is monitoring the blockchain. And so I hope everybody can see that starting with unidirectional channels using a default field in the transaction, moving on to bidirectional uh, channels that utilize the CSV relative time lock output incumbents, on to Lightning Network, which makes use of the CLTV absolute time lock and hash locks, which is something that has been a part of Bitcoin since the very beginning. All of these very basic things are combined to make a very powerful protocol built on really the most simple smart contracts. All right, and before we wrap up this video, I thought it was worth mentioning uh, and responding to a few different uh, popular FUD points going around. I guess if uh, you want to take the first one, did you? Yeah, so one of the most common uh, misconceptions that I hear about the Lightning Network is that in order to receive Bitcoin um, over the Lightning Network, you have to have Bitcoin and you have to have Bitcoin to participate in the Lightning Network. And that's not really true because um, as we've talked about with both of the channels, you can have someone else um, fund the channel. You don't have to, both parties don't have to fund the channel. Um, so like, for example, if you were getting paid by someone, uh, the person paying you could put the necessary funds into the channel that they have with you, pay you, and that would be it. And 
because they are planning to, you know, obviously send you the money that they're putting into the channel, there's not really a lot of reason for you to like cheat them out of money because it's money that you would receive anyway. So it wouldn't make sense for you to really cheat. Um, because if you did try to cheat, then you, you would either get penalized, which would be stupid, or if you were successful, you would just receive the money that you were already going to receive. All right. Well, um, to kind of build off of Janine's point, uh, you can take that even one step further and somebody who's not even a party to a channel can fund a channel. So I imagine somebody would think, well, if somebody pays me and opens a channel with me, what if they're offline all the time and I can't make payments? Well, that person could just fund a channel for you with a highly connected node and solve that problem. But uh, an another point that uh, I've seen on Twitter a lot lately, which is kind of silly to me, is the uh, people kind of screaming that you, you can only make payments if, if the person is online. Well, if you really think about this, in internet commerce, the person you're paying is online all the time. That's not an issue. And when you get to meet space and you're talking about commerce, even when you're on chain, the sender at least has to have an internet connection to send the transaction. And so if the receiver doesn't, I mean, we have NFC, we have Wi-Fi, we have Bluetooth. To think that it's a monumental problem to find a way for the receiver to piggyback on the sender's internet connection, which is required on chain too, and make use of that to confirm a payment is kind of silly. And so really the, the only place I think that has validity is passive payments that are not for somebody running a business that are not made in person. And honestly, I think that there will be solutions for those things. So uh, I hope this has been educational and I guess we'll see you next time, guys. Bye.